Could I greet you in the blessed name of our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Well, I trust you have a set of notes. It can be a physical form also in the electronic form. Okay, if you need the physical form, it's right at the back of the sanctuary. Okay, we thank God for the past year and also for the new year as we uh, continue to look up to God uh, for His goodness and faithfulness upon us. Okay, let us begin a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we give thanks to Thee for this Lord's Day that we can come before Thy Holy Presence to seek Thee in Thy Word. Cleanse out, O Lord, of all our sins and grant unto us Thy wisdom and understanding that we may be able to understand Thy Word and apply Thy Word into our life in a manner that we will be able to glorify Thee. Cleanse out, O Lord, of all our sins and we commit all this with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we took a break from uh, last quarter and we had uh, the learning of the music in worship led by Brother David. Well, I enjoyed every lesson. Now, it's something which uh, I don't think I will be able to teach like him okay, he, because he, he, he taught and also played the piano. I, I think uh, <laughs> because I'm not musically inclined, so I will never be able to play the piano. But thank God for the lesson learned because the principles taught are very uh, important and and it, I, I think it's, it really helped us to appreciate uh, the, the faithful stand of the church. It okay, also enable us to know that you know, our worship is not, uh, does not appear in the vacuum. It has all been well prepared. Okay, the stand that uh, this church is taking. And so we have to pray for the session, we pray for the chairman, we pray for the musicians, and we pray for we as worshippers know that we may worship God in spirit and in truth. And so we pray that we will continue to stand upon God's word so that we will not allow uh, worldliness to creep into our worship okay, that will cause us to offer strange fire and God will be angry with us. Okay, so we pray that the Lord will help us remember what we have learned. And so let us turn our Bible to Psalm 57. There are 11 verses for our meditation this afternoon. Okay, Psalm 57. Okay, let me read to you. Okay, 11 verses. Psalm 57. To the chief musician, Al-Tachi, mistime of David when he fled from Saul in the cave. Verse 1. Be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me. For my soul trusted in thee, yea, in the shadow of thy wing, will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that will swallow me up, Selah. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. My soul is among lions, and I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above the earth. Verse 6. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me. Into the midst that whereof they are fallen themselves. Selah. My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up, my glory. Awake, sorcery and heart. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations. For thy mercy is great unto the heavens, and thy truth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. Okay, may God bless the reading of His holy and precious word. Now, be thou exalted, O God, is the title which I gave to this psalm. Okay, as you can see in the notes, 
taken mainly from verse 5 and verse 11. Now, this also very nicely suggested. Okay, this is a two-part psalm. Okay, the first part will be on the cry of the psalmist. And then the second part will be the praise of the psalmist. Okay, so it's uh, quite, quite easy to, to see as an overview. Okay, the first part is the cry, the second part is the praise. And so exhorting God okay, is the whole theme of this psalm. Now it is a privilege which you and I uh, must be convicted in our hearts. How we ought to exhort God all the time. It is not going to be by force or by constraint. No, it is going to be from the heart. No, you are moved in the heart to exhort God. So it's not, not something that is mechanical. It is something that comes from the heart. No, the deep seat that is found in our heart. That we want to praise God. We want to cry out to God. We want to look up to God you know, from the bottom of your heart. Okay, and what we are going to see here in this psalm is how the psalmist in his struggle Okay, and also, uh, because of all the attacks that fell upon him, what's so overwhelming that he had no way you know, to find any form of release, that he had to cry out to God. I think that is also our experience, isn't it? You know, when, we, when we are able to cry out to God, you know, it is a form of release of our soul that we know that you know, God is there to hear us. God is there to, to help us. That's why we cry out to Him. Okay? And so, in the confession of the psalmist, we can see the psalmist's deep understanding and the knowledge of God in whom he was crying out to. Okay? And this is important uh, to note okay? because this brings out the true belief. You, know, the, you may even want to call it the true colour you know, because it, re it reveals really what is found in our hearts. Okay, so there is no pretense because our faith has been put to the test. Okay, your faith in Christ is being challenged. Okay, when everything is well, you tell me God is good, God is uh, providing for you, God is uh, blessing you. Surely we will believe with all our hearts okay, because we are living in good time. But then when everything is not well, troubles keep abounding. No, do you really believe that God is still good? Do you really believe that God is still providing? Do you really believe that God is still blessing you? That is a real challenge, isn't it, to our faith. Now, if your faith is weak, you will be very scared. Okay? And, and, and you'll be wondering, where is God when I need Him? And then as you cry out to Him, God, are you listening? Or have you abandoned me? And so we need to examine ourselves. Because the problem is not with God. The problem is us. How strong is our faith? You know, when, when, when we are in deep trouble, do we really look to God? Do we really trust in Him? And so the first part we see is the heart cry of the psalmist. And then the second part is the praise you know, after his cry. Okay, after, his, after crying out, after confessing, the struggles, and also the, the, the true faith that he has in the God who loved him, who cared for him, and what he can do for you, then you will not continue to cry anymore. Your cry will turn into praise. Okay? And so that is the order. Okay? Cry first and then pray. Okay? That, that is what we, are, we clearly see in Psalm 57. Okay, so may God help us as we go through uh, this psalm verse by verse. Now, in the introduction on page one, okay, we read in the preface at the beginning of the psalm to the chief musician Altachi, okay, missed time of David when he fled from Saul in the cave. Now, these are the inspired words, you know, as part of the psalm. Okay, please do not see these words as uh, something that is additional, something that is by the way. You know, maybe it's just to uh, add to the reading of the psalm. No, it's, it's, these are the inspired words. Preserved for us. And so therefore, important, not redundant. Okay, so let us look at the preface. Now, to the chief musician, in other words, this psalm is to be handed over 
to the chief musician in order to regulate the manner in which this psalm is to be sung. Okay, and then with the music that accompanied it, and it was followed by Altachi, we have the literal meaning to destroy not. Now, it was likely used to play to the tune you know, that was to follow the mood of the psalm. So, Altachi could be the tune. Now, if you look at the previous psalm, you know, for those who uh, studied the psalm together in Psalm 56, we see in the preface, okay, if you look at Psalm 56, okay, if you turn to uh, Psalm 56, which is just the previous psalm, you will see in the preface, okay, before verse 1, to the chief musician upon Jonah Alam Rekokim. Wow, this very long word. Okay, what does it mean? It means um, a silent dove in distant places. That's what, it, what, that's what this phrase means. Okay, and this describes the somber mood of one who is far away okay, from his beloved holy land of Israel. And so there is a tune that describes this mood and feeling. And so Psalm 56 is to be sung to this tune. Okay, and this tune is called Donat Alem Rekokim. And so similarly, as we look at Psalm 57, it also used the somber mood of one who is pleading to God that he be not destroyed. Okay, so it's in the same way. Of course, the, the mood is different. The mood is a cry unto God, you know, that God will be merciful, that he will not be destroyed. Okay, so it's interesting that there is such a, a tune okay, that is uh, you know, to regulate such a, such a mood to the psalm. Okay, so it's very interesting. Okay, so that's what we need to take note. Okay? Because that will tell us the... No, the way in which the Jews will sing this psalm. It's not going to be a happy, it's not going to be something that is uh, no, all the way in a happy note. Beginning, it will be the cry. And then afterward, the cry will turn into praise. So the, the mood is in such a progression. Okay? So uh, it will be good to just take note of this. Now, there are a total of four psalms that is following this tune of our touches. Okay, Psalm 57 over here, and then also in Psalm 58, 59, and also Psalm 75. Okay, when you will also find the altar chief in the preface. Okay, so just take note of this. And then Miss Tam of David. Now, if you, have, um, if you have my notes on Psalm 56, well, I make a mistake okay, in, in the notes. Okay, because I, I confuse that with another word called machu. The word machu, it means... Or instruction or teaching. So when you see the word machu, it means that this psalm is a teaching psalm. Okay, but I confuse that with uh, machu. So this word mishtam, what does it mean? It means engraved. Okay, an engraved poem or engraved psalm. And so it tells of the significance of the content of the poem or the psalm that is being engraved. Now, how do you engrave? You know, you engrave on, on gold, okay, according to what I did in my research. How David instructed the engravers. You know, when you see this mishtam, these are the psalms that have been engraved. And there are a total six psalms that have been engraved. Now, you won't engrave uh, you know, all the psalms. You know, I, I believe the engravers will be very thankful, very relieved. Well, good thing King David did not ask me to engrave all the psalms. 150 psalms. No joke. Only six psalms. Okay, six psalms which are Psalm 56 or Psalm 16, Psalm 56, 57, 58, 59, and 60. Okay, only these six psalms. Okay, so these are the golden verses of David. Okay, and it was, it was very likely that it was when King David or uh, you no, know, he was uh, ruling in the palace that he ordered the engravers to you know, really engrave out uh, these six psalms. And then the context was also, was also given to us when he fled from Saul in the cave. So it's a context. Now this is one of the several psalms given the occasion and the context in which the psalm was written. And it is very helpful because we know what is happening. 
Okay, and we can put ourselves in David's shoes as we go through his experiences. Now, there are two caves which the Bible revealed to us. You know how uh, David hide himself in this cave, you know, hiding from Saul. According to 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 1, he was hiding in the cave of Adullam. Okay, I'm told it's the first cave. And then according to 1 Samuel 24, uh, verses 1 to 3, he was hiding in another cave in Engedi. Okay, so these two caves were revealed to us. I believe there may be other caves okay, which uh, you know, David hide from Saul okay, when he fled from him. Okay, so there could be other caves around. Now it tells us that David has to flee from King Saul and hide himself in the cave. This means that he was forced to leave his own home, okay, his own city, run away from where he belonged to, okay, and escape for his dear life. And so it was a very tense situation. Okay, and it was at such a situation where he penned down this son. How he draw near to God in his cry as well and in his praise, in exaltation of God's name. Okay, so we pray that the Lord will help us you know, as we go through the psalm together. And so we begin with David's cry you know, as he exalted God in the highest in his heart cry. Verse 1. Be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me. For my soul trusted in thee, yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. Now God is exalted when uh, he is remembered by his people as the only one who is in control. Not his enemies, not himself, not the devil. Okay? And that has always been the psalmist's heart towards God. Whenever he is in trouble, well, the first person the psalmist goes to is not man. It's God. And that tells us you know, the devotion that the psalmist had towards God, which we must learn. And God deserves to be exalted in this way. Okay, God wants us to cry out to Him first. Not after we exhausted all our help, you know, if really there's no one to help, then we think of God. No, God does not want us to think of Him in this way. God does not want us to think of Him only in emergency time. God wants us to think of Him first and foremost because that will be the first in our heart. He will be the one who, whom we think of when we fall into deep trouble. Uh, so God wants us to think of Him first. Okay, and that is what uh, the psalmist has done over here. Now the psalmist being the king's fugitive, cried out to God for mercy. Now who is the one who pursue after him? It's the king. It's Saul. And so by right, you know, normally, we will be seeking for mercy from the one who will pursue us. But over here, the psalmist somehow did it differently. He did not seek mercy from Saul. He sought after mercy from God. Why? Well, because God is in control. Saul is not in control. The psalmist realized that his life is not in Saul's hand, but rather in God's hand. And so that's why he said it two times. Be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me. Twice. If you look at Psalm 56, he only said once. But over here, it must be so intense. No, he's telling himself he must seek after God. Don't ever forget that. He must always remember God. But David may be fleeing from Saul. But there is no way David will be harmed without God's permission. And so, that, so therefore, David did the right thing okay, by pleading for God's mercy. And even also in, in such a situation, David could have fought back you know, without even writing this psalm. He could have fought back 
Who is, who is King Saul? Yes, he is the king. But do you know that at the time when the Philistine was at war with Israel, you know, when Goliath challenged Israel, no one else came forth to fight against him. Only David. And so David had this reputation. You know, David could have taken pride in his own victory in his own strength, his own ability, even far better than the king himself. Who is King Saul? I can easily overcome him. If I can overcome Goliath, who is King Saul? Isn't it? But look at how David did not take things in his own hand. He cried out to God for mercy because David trusted in God. And so this is a vivid and beautiful picture of such a trust that David had in God. In fact, the picture was as if God had great wings you know, and David comes under the shadow of the wings of God, knowing that God will provide him with absolute safety and protection. I think we can imagine that kind of protection, you know, like the mother hen, how she protected all the little, little chicks under the shadow of her wings from the soaring eagle flying above them. Well, it's a wonderful picture of how we are also you know, under the, the safe hands, the good hands of our God. And then under, until the calamities be overpassed. Well, the calamities here is not the the destruction due to nature. But it refers to human enemies who set themselves against God and His people. And so David had this confidence that he will be under safe hands until all the enemies be subdued and destroyed by God. Okay, so God is the only one who can help him. And David acknowledged that in his cry. And that is the exhortation, isn't it? how he exhort God in his cry towards God. And then in verse 2 we read, I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performed all things for me. So David knew his place. Before the almighty God, to him he is the lowest, and God is the highest. And David confessed that there is none above God at all. And so God had been exhorted by David's cry as the most high God. Okay, even though God is the highest, it does not mean that God is so far away that He cannot be reached, that He cannot be approached to. Well, the most powerful man in our land is our PM. But who can reach Him? Maybe His close one, maybe His family, His wife, His children. Can we reach Him? Anytime, anywhere, we can't. But God is higher than all these human leaders, no matter how powerful they can be. And yet, we can reach to God. Because God has made Himself reachable. God has made Himself approachable to you and me. And see how David declared that He is a God that performed all things for me. So, he, so in other words, God is not so far away that he cannot be known that we have nothing to do with Him. God is for me, the psalmist says. He is a personal God who draws near to His people and God is willing to bless them. He is willing to provide for them. And the next verse 35, verse 3, He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of Him that will swallow me up, Selah. God shall send forth His mercy and His truth. Now, it was not filling the blanks what God is going to send from heaven to save the psalmy. It's not up to us to think how God is going to save us. The answer is given. You know, the next part of the verse. God shall send forth His mercy and truth. And that is how He's going to protect us. And that is how He's going to lead us into safety. Because we live in a world that is void of truth. 
and love. And so we must realize that this world is not our home. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. And so as such, we who live in this world must live according to God's will and God's desire. Surely we will not be spared from the wealth of the devils. Because every day is a struggle. It's a spiritual battle. And the world seeks to devour us, to destroy us, you know, which means we may end up fearing God and be drawn further and further away from Him. And this has always been the aim of the devil, to cause God's people to turn their back on Him, to their Creator. You know, the devil always wants us to, to feel that God is shortchanging us. God is hiding the the happiness that can be found in the world. But that is the devil's deception, isn't it? Will you also be deceived? Or have you also added to the list of those who have been deceived? And so therefore we need God's mercy, God's truth to be protected from the spiritual darkness of this world. I will explain a little bit more about God's mercy and truth you know, when we come to verse 10 because we see the same uh, combination come together again in verse 10. Now the world under the God of this world is not a weak world. Okay? And, and the enemies are not weak at all. The spiritual darkness is powerful. And so therefore David was under powerful attacks from the evil one. Okay, the, the ammunition that has been provided by the devil so that there will be more and more attacks upon God's people. Look at verse 4. My soul is among lions, and I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. Now the lions are fierce animals. Okay, and, and these are very hungry, very angry lions. And so who will survive in the midst of such lions? And yet the Sami described himself being surrounded by this kind of lion, all ready to tear him into pieces anytime. And then it was said that these lions are set on fire, meaning that they are very vibrant, full of energy. There was not even a sign of weakness. No, the lions are not sleepy at all. The lions are all fully awake, because they are hungry, they are angry, ready to devour you. And so ended up in their hands is as good as done and gone. All ready to pound on anyone who come in their way. And so David knew his circumstances very well. He knew his life can be taken away anytime, if not for God's mercy. He told David made the wise choice. No, he did not sought mercy from the lion. He did not stop mercy from the enemies because he knows that God can stop the mouth of the lions. God can destroy all his enemies anytime. Or he could have wallowed himself in self-pity and then surrendered himself to King Saul. His life would be spared, but he didn't. Instead, he cried out to God. And that is the adaptation that he's shown to us. Verse 5, which is the last verse of the first part. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. And though David exalted God in time of great distress, by his cry, and the language here is a, a clear one, how he seeks to magnify God to the highest, even above the heaven. Now, David is definitely suffering. He is not trying to you know, put on a bitter smile. No. He is really suffering. He may be crying, truly crying, not, not shedding crocodile tears. He is really crying because of the great suffering. He, he cried out to God. And God heard him. God saw his tears. And so it is real. The attacks are real, but the focus is not himself anymore. The focus is on God who is the greatest of all. 
Because God is in control of everything, even over His enemies. God is in control over our life and even our death. Do we really look to God and exalt Him up on high? Will we cry out to Him in time of distress? God deserves it, isn't it? God deserves to be exalted by His people. If they won't, who will? And so David truly exalted God in his cry. Okay, because of all the troubles that he faced due to, due to the enemies. But he did not stop here. He turned his cry into praise. You know, which is the next section that we are going to see in this psalm from verses 6 to 11. And so in verse 6, we begin with David's praise. Look at verse 6. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me, in the midst whereof they are fallen themselves, sailor. Now the manner in which the enemies of David sought after his life, no, it's not uh, no, the, 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 the game we, we know, play, no, play catching. No, it's not. It's not like this. No, when we were young, uh, how we play catching is the one who run after the other. Once you touch a person, the person has to squat down. The person is as good as... Or cannot play anymore. Okay, until everyone is being caught. And then he is the winner. And then game over. And then everything will start over again. But the way in which the enemies pursued after David, no, it's not so simple. There were traps everywhere. They laid snatch and wood a fowler did to the birds. No, how do we catch a bird? No, we put a basket no, with a stick then tied to a string, and then he put some seeds under the basket. And then when the bird goes in, then you just pull the stick and then the basket will close. Very simple, isn't it? The traps. But these are the many traps that David encountered you know, when Saul pursued after him. Of course, not as simple as this kind of the basket and the string trap. There will be more deeper traps than this. And King Saul, with his, with his best men, all experienced in warfare, probably drew plan after plan, know how to catch David, know how to trap him. Now we draw comparison to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, know how he was often you know, so-called to be trapped by the Pharisees and the scribes. Because they wanted to get rid of him. They were jealous of of, of the people who keep on crowding around the Lord Jesus. And so they wanted to get rid of Jesus. And so they come up with traps to, to catch him. You know, once he said wrongly, ah, they have good reason to arrest him. But did they succeed? They didn't. They were caught by their own traps, okay, by the high wisdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so in the same way, David's enemies fell to their own pits you know, in which they designed for him, although it was not told to us how. But that was what was testified by David himself. And it was not the physical traps. It was the kind of mental traps. I think the mental traps are more deadly than the physical traps. You know, for those who have been to national service, we all know that you know, physical training can be easily overcome. You just train a little bit more. You just persevere, you just press on. But it is the mental training. The mental training that is torturing. Because once your mental uh, capacity is defeated, you are discouraged, then you are ready to give up. Even though you may have the strength to go on. But because your mental capacity is already defeated, you have already surrendered, then you don't want to press on anymore. That's how you are, you are being pinned down. That's how people overcome you. And that's how Satan works to destroy God's people in this way. Okay, David was no doubt discouraged okay, because he was turned into the fugitive for no good reason. Suddenly he's a wounded man. Suddenly he cannot walk openly in the streets. Wherever he goes, he had to hide himself. 
He got to run. No, who liked this kind of life? Not for David. No one in his sound mind would choose this kind of unstated life. Always running away. But God is the one who strengthened his faith. He could have given up. He could have surrendered to King David. But he didn't. God strengthened his faith and David pressed on. He did not give up. I thought the wicked strategy of the enemy did not work. Okay, their plan failed miserably. I thought from cry to praise, is there not a cause for David to praise God? Absolutely. Look at verse 7 on page 3. My heart is fixed, O God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. So from cry to praise, this has always been the divine order you know, for every child of God who is learning to trust in God while going through difficulty. Because of the difficulty, we may cry. And we must cry. We cannot be you know, having the, the kind of do not care attitude. We must cry because we are concerned. And we want to do well. We want to overcome. But if we cry out to God, God will not let, let us cry all the way. God will turn our cry into praise. Because God will open our eyes to see His power. And then He will assure us that He will be there for us. And so in verse 7, David confessed his heart is fixed. And twice he said this. What does he mean? Now the word fixed here means to be ready. To be established. In other words, David is saying, no matter what happened, his heart for God is ready and is established. He will never waver in his trust towards God. His heart is fixed. I'm sure we all want a fixed heart. A heart that is established, a heart that is firm, you know, and, and we fix our eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the foundation of the faith of David is laid sure. Okay, and firm within his heart. And David must have learned very well from his own parents, from his father, from his mother, how they taught him concerning the word of God. I thought it is the word of God that has strengthened him. No, it's not plucked out of thin air and then suddenly David was strengthened. No, it must have been the years of learning from God's word. And David had learned well. And David knew God and he is still knowing Him. And he continued to grow in grace and in the knowledge of God. And so that is what enabled him, you know, his heart to be fixed toward God. So is this not a good cause to, to sing and praise God in exhortation to His name? Verse 8, Awake up, my glory, awake, sorcery and harp. I myself will awake early. Now the glory here refers to his own soul. You know, the word glory refers to something that is of weight. Okay, so what is the thing that carries weight in a man? Is it not his soul? It is not a physical body because the, the, the body will die one day. The Lord himself says, you know, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world but lose his own soul? So the soul is of great importance. God wants man to see the importance of his soul okay, and then to do something about it. Now, man's soul is spiritually dead because of sin. And so it needs to be revived again. And, and the only way to be revived is the only way that God has provided through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. That is the only way. There's no other way. So sinful man must turn to God through Christ. Okay, otherwise, it is a sure death in the lake of fire. And so David is calling for his soul. You know, it means his, I mean, it means that he speaks to himself. Okay, he's calling for his soul to rise up, to be alive, to be alert, to be enthusiastic in lifting up his voice to praise God. You know, how, how, how do we praise God? You know, it, it shouldn't be lethargic. It, couldn't, it shouldn't be without life. You know, having the heart and the mind all filled with worldliness 
and carnal desire. How can our heart be in this condition, in our praise? You can't. You can't praise God in this way. So how do we worship the Lord in this afternoon? Do we prepare our heart to worship God by waking us up, you know, to, uh, the, the soul that is sanctified, the soul that is prepared, the soul that is all ready to, to render praise and worship to God? So are we alive, alert and enthusiastic to come before God's presence in worship? And so we must ask, how do we prepare ourselves? What did we do this morning? What did we do last night? What did we do along the whole week? Do we prepare ourselves for the Lord's day to meet with God in worship? Not many a time our preparation only starts a few minutes before the actual worship. And how can our heart be prepared like this? We can't. We are deceiving ourselves no, if we do not prepare. How can God accept this kind of worship? It's even worse than strange fire, isn't it? Because strange fire is the direct rebellion. God will shut it off. But then for us, we think that our worship is okay. But that will be a great deception to ourselves when we think that our worship will be accepted. And so we need to prepare ourselves adequately well. You know, after the close of the Lord's Day, it is the start of our preparation for the, for the next Lord's Day to come. That will be our attitude. In fact, one has, uh, one has said this, you know, every Lord's Day is a rehearsal you know, of the eternal heavenly glory to come. One day we will be worshipping God for eternity. Imagine this kind of worship will be not just two hours every Lord's Day. It will be for eternity. You know, are, are, do we look forward to that or, or do we long for these two hours to, to come to an end? I think that will really reveal our hearts, isn't it? And so let us look at the psalmist and learn from him. He is all ready to render praise to God. Verse, verse 9. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations. Lord, the psalmist is not going to keep everything under wraps. Whatever he knows about God, he wants to declare it. He wants the whole world to know who is this God? Who is this merciful God? He wants to shout out loud for what God has done for him. And, he, and this is the way he, he wants to exalt God in the highest. And so that is a declaration, that is a confession that he made. What God has done, so that the whole world will know, so that the whole world will bow down to this same God. And so we must do the same if we call ourselves Christian. Verse 10, For thy mercy is great into, unto the heavens, and thy truth unto the clouds. Not mercy and truth again. Now these two are inseparable brothers okay, who go hand in hand. Now the world deserves to perish because of the greatness of their sin, but God is merciful to save some okay, by leading them to the gospel of Jesus Christ, whereby they receive salvation. God could have left them all to perish without salvation. And God will not be charged you know, for not saving them. That is their rightful portion. Yet God is merciful. And how great is His mercy? The psalmist says, His mercy is great unto the heavens. It goes beyond our human comprehension. And so therefore we cannot question. God, why did you save me? Why didn't you save others? We can't. It is not for us to question God in this way. If God has shown mercy to us, we just give thanks. We just continue to pray for His mercy to be upon us. That's what the psalmist is doing. Right in the very first verse, he sought after God's mercy. And so, be merciful unto me, O merciful God. 
And then truth would demand justice and righteousness to be fulfilled as well. Because God's mercy is not dispensed by covering up sin or condoning sin. That is true. And truth will reveal who God is in His fullness. So it will not be just uh, abundant mercy that we see how God is showing forth to His people. It will also by His infinite grace, His love, His justice, His righteousness, His faithfulness and many more. And that is the beauty of His truth that has been sent forth as lights when we are called Truth BP Church. We are supposed to know God's truth. And and Apostle Paul says, we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. And so we must stand for the truth. And this truth is the truth of who God is according to His word. And so truth is God's way of telling us what we really need. We need His truth, especially in this world. Know that it's full of lies and falsehood. Full of hypocrisy and full of wickedness. And so we need to turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full in His wonderful faith. Then we shall see the truth in Him and delight in His truth. And then we pattern our lives according to His truth and be sent forth as light and truth in this world. Okay, God's word is truth. And so that's the reason why we must know it well. Okay, finally, in verse 11, we conclude the exaltation in praise. Verse 11. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. We shall repeat of verse 5. And it is worth repeating. Because God is exalted by the praise He rightly deserves. In fact, praise to God knows no boundary. There should not be any boundary. Okay, because He is the God of all His creation. All His creatures must praise Him and not otherwise. And so as the psalmist continues to flee for his life, it doesn't mean that at the end of the psalm he, he is free. He, no, he continues to, to, to flee, continues to run away from, from Saul. But he also continues to cry. He also continues to praise God. He continue to exhort God in his life. And so may we learn from David, from cry to praise, as he exhort God to the highest. Okay, so may God help us. So there's nothing to worry at all because we know we are in good hands. Okay, we just have to walk by faith, not by sight. Living in His truth, abiding in Him, be faithful, till we meet our Lord and our Saviour face to face one day. May God help us. Let us pray. Our merciful, loving Heavenly Father, how we cry unto Thee in time like this, and how we are struggling with the weakness of our flesh and against the spiritual darkness of this world, day in and day out. Day out. Help us, O God, to fight a good fight of faith, Help us, O God, to walk by faith and not by sight, knowing with great confidence in our hearts that Thou hast sent mercy and truth to protect us and lead us by the way. Be Thou exalted, O God, and turn our cry to praise and how we may exalt Thee in the highest. May we be found faithful in our life and in our service. Now, And until we meet our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, face to face, in Jesus' name, we give thanks and pray. Amen. Thank you and see you next week.